Hi, everyone. Welcome to History Challenge number one. My name is Kevin Williams, and I teach history at Davis Senior High School in Davis, California. Our first guest is an amazing man with an amazing story. You, if you've seen the documentary God Grew Tired of Us, or if you've read any of his books, you will know John Dow. He is well known for being one of the most outspoken and active former Lost Boys from back in the 1980s. So I'd like to welcome John. Well, Kevin, thank you very much um, uh, for inviting me and also asking these questions. There is nothing so important in my life than to explain or share. And our first question goes back to before the Civil War, before everything that transpired in your life that put you on this difficult and amazing journey. Did you grow up in a village in South Sudan? And what was your life like before the Civil War hit? Uh, when I grew up in a place called Dupayel in South Sudan, you know, our life was beautiful. I mean, although there was nothing there, it's, it, what I say by there was nothing there, there was no piece of civilization. There were no roads, there were no schools, there were no high hospitals or clinics or cars, things that you would see here on a daily basis in the United States, things that, you know, sort of accompany your life, things that make your life better, things that will move your life, will, will, will make everything easy for you, things that you live with uh, in the United States. They were not there in my village. But what beautiful thing that was there, we were, you know, live in a village, a, a typical village, uh, where there's a little village there, another village there, there will be a giant big village. There were no town cities. So these giant villages and these small villages were, uh, you know, how our great great grandparent lived, and, and of course, until us. So what do what did we do, you know, on a daily basis, for example? In the village, everyone has a job. Right from whether you are five years old or 99 years old, you have something to do. If you are a boy, uh, maybe at, right at about age five, age six, you have a duty to do. For example, you would take care of chicken. Um, so you make sure that your chicken are not eaten by bob, bob cat or wild cat. Let's say chicken are making noise. So you run to them. You run to where they, they are making noise. Something is eating them. Either being or, or being attacked. Your chicken is missing. So you protect them. You go to a neighborhood and say, hey, have you guys seen my chicken here? So that's your job. If you are a boy again, I mean, age, age let me say age eight to age nine and 10 there, your job is to transition from taking care of chicken to take care of goats. And then when the right you from 10, let's say 10, 11, 12, now you transition from goat or sheep taking care of goat or sheep to taking care of cows. And so that is a, you know, something you would do. I mean, and then later you bring them home. So that is good. Then you've done your work. So you do that day in, day out. There was no school, as I said before. So your job here, is to, to take care of animals, is to have a job. And that is what I want to tell your, your student right now, that they think that there's the only one place where you can learn, where you can have education. And that place is a, a school. That place is a classroom. That is correct. That is what, you know, th these are the places in the United States or other places can learn. That is wonderful. It's beautiful. It's great. So I have no problem with that. But in South Sudan, we don't have, uh, you know, classroom, we don't have school. So we learn through doing things. We learn through when you're taking care of chicken, goats, sheep, cows. As you're doing that, you're learning. You're learning lessons. So our learning was sort of like a hand-on. So you, you, somebody's telling you, somebody who is older than you telling you, this is how you take care of cow. This is how you climb out on the end, end mountain. That's a little end mountain where you, because we're very short, but a little cat. So you have to climb on a tree. This is what you do. So climbing in the United States, I see that they build something called rope climbing and things like that. They have to pay money to have their children go and climb something like that. 
beautiful. It's good. I have no problem with that. But in South Sudan, you don't have to pay to her to teach your child to climb. You, you know, climb tree, climb little uh, ant hill or little mountain, things like hill, things like that. You gotta have to do it. This is a daily sort of uh, a learning process in South Sudan. If you are a girl, for example, if you are a little girl, then you start taking care of things as young as you are five seven or something like that you start taking care of of of, uh, of, of, of your you know siblings if you have if you're older you take care of the younger one and then then you start going to the poorest which means you start going with your mom or your uh, aunties or your uh, older sister you go and fetch firewood you look for firewood and then bring firewood every single day if you're a girl that's what you do every single day now, in America, people are very blessed. They have, uh, you know, kitchen inside the building, of course, and they have something called a stove. They, turn, they, they you know, twist it and turn, and voila, there's a fire there, and then you start cooking, okay? And then when you're done, you turn it off. In South Sudan, it's not like that. You know, as a girl, you do this every single day. You go get firewood for dinner. You go get firewood for lunch. So you gotta have, get more big bundle so that you cannot go tomorrow, so that you have more time at home. So that's what you do. Girls, again, they learn how to weave, weave things, you know, uh, baskets, things like that. They are trained. That is their classroom. This is, you know, and then they, are, they do other craft thing, things that are important to be, to be uh, sold and so on. And they are, as they are doing that, they are taught how to become a mom later how to become a responsible girl, how to become, uh, you know, a, a leader, you know, among women, among girls, how, you know, the lessons of respect, the lesson of uh, being polite, the lesson of hard work, the lesson of, uh, of, of these important community values there are taught through that. That is our school. So that is exactly the life we led when I was young in my village. Wow. Thank you so much for that. I often, uh, we, we talk um, in our RSJ class a lot about IQ tests or any sort of literacy test only showing what we consider in our country to be education and knowledge. And I think what you've just added is knowledge and education could be shown in so many different ways. I, I always say to my students, if you took me and honestly, if you put me in a village in South Sudan, I would be seen as probably the village idiot because I wouldn't know how to do anything, right? So I think ed knowledge is based on what people do in that society. And I think we need to get away from the idea that knowledge can only be one thing. And that is going through school and going through college and having a degree. And like, like you said, that's, that's all great, but that's limited in the view. So that leads me to a follow-up to that question. So before the civil war and you're, you're this young child in your village, did you ever think of the world outside of your village? And did you ever think, I want to do, I want to leave the village? Or is that not even something that really crosses your mind when you're young? I didn't know that there was, there was, that there was a place called Kenya. There was a place called Ethiopia. Uh, let, let, let alone places like America and Europe and other places, Asia and so on. The, only, the village that we used to have, of course, when I say we used to have, now it's no longer there in terms of, of understanding of what is the village. So the village that we used to live in, it was the entire world. That was our world. Where you can't see anywhere, that was it. So we, we thought we were the only people. And that is why when you listen to our songs, uh, especially either the song that we compose for God or a song that we compose for ourselves, we are the only one. We are the human being. You know, the Dinka are the human being there. <laughs> That's what we think we were. So I, I was not aware of the surrounding. I know you've spoken a lot in the film, God Grew Tired of Us, details the journey of you as a lost boy. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about when you joined the migration that became known as the Lost Boys, how many boys were in the group when you joined? How did the process of your migration change and when did you take on more responsibility? 
And finally, so that's the second question. And then finally, is during that migration, were you at all aware that the outside world understood what you were going through? Well, when we uh, left our home, there were only two of us. So the, an adult and myself. And then from there, three days later, uh, <clears throat> as it was apparent that we may not go back, and so we were five of us. So uh, a woman and her two daughters and two of us. So there were five of us. We, we, we mean we kept going toward east uh, as we, you know, went through all the tough things until later we met into uh, uh, you know, the other group as well. So we were 19. Uh, the third time we were 19 then and then kept going. As we go, it's like a snowboarding. So when you roll a snowball, and then you find some in the, so, and then by the time we were almost going to Ethiopia, we were 27. But then our number got reduced to only four. <laughs> only four, the, 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 you know, we were 27, four of us made it to Ethiopia in our group. But there were other groups going somewhere, uh, were coming a different direction, different time. But our own group started out two, then we were five, 19, 27, by the time we entered Ethiopia, only four survived. We got there, and then we found there were some peer people there, and then a few, few days later, more people coming from different directions. And so we sort of all converge into that area. And then about 8,000, I guess, maybe 8,000 of us in the first few months there. And then, so as we were the big group there, so we were then organized by adults who were there. So they put us into group. So we start from group one to group, sort of group eight. Uh, so 1,000 people as one group, you know. Then well, those who are a little bit taller, like I was, and maybe, I don't know, may, might have shown some sort of leadership or whatever it is. So those who are a little bit, uh, you know, so we were selected to be leaders. So this is when my group now started. So because we lost families, each of these over 8,000 people lost their family. They hear mostly children, mostly boys, and so they're there. So because we lost families, we create our own families by forming 50 people as a group. Uh, and then, and then and later, this group got into more, into more, into like 1,200 boys. Uh, you know, so this is when our role now started. So then I stopped being a child here. In terms of, so I, I got it. I have a role to do. I have a role to, to, uh, you know, sort of uh, take care here because uh, these kids are crying every day. They want to eat food. They want to drink milk. They want to see their mothers. So I, as at that time, at 12 years old, uh, you know, I, you know, put myself as an adult, uh, like, like a, a parent to them. You know, I give them some support. Hey, tomorrow will be good. You know, we got this, giving them sort of like hope to have uh, as a leader could, could, could do. At that time, there was no chance of coaching. I mean, nobody coached us. So we were coached by the situation. We were coached by the environment. We were coached by, by what, what was in, a, in, in front of us. So then, then I become the leader there uh, as something that I did not, I didn't run for it, but because I was picked. And I thought, oh, you know, I would not, not fail my brothers here. I'm going to do it. What I have seen my mother used to do, my father used to do, is what exactly th those helped me during that time. Or when we go taking care of our cows, must be responsible for your cow, must be responsible for your goat or chicken. So that's what, you, that's what I used to do when I became the leader of that group. That leadership role never left me at all. I mean, I start to keep going. So as we're moving from Ethiopia back into South Sudan and then later into Kenya, we were going as a group. You know, so there are other leaders inside your group who say, you be in front, so and so be in the middle, and so and so will be back with me. So you make sure everyone is going together. No one is left behind. What knowledge did you have that there was this refugee program that you could apply for? Were you a, aware of this program? And what led you to apply for it? None of us actually applied for it. So what happened was there is a group called the, Uni the, 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 the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, known as UNHCR. 
So UNHCR is responsible for, for the refugee camp. Then. So then they, because of the United States uh, generosity, bringing uh, refugees to America each year, uh, so America go to the UNHCR, what group that need to be resettled? Because they have no, uh, you know, sort of hope that war is going to end soon, things like that. So we were there as a group called Lost Boys. And so in the, you know, I guess somehow they communicated with the Congress here. And the Congress approved that the Lost Boys would come because it was introduced to them uh, or explained to them that the Lost Boys, these are pr primarily young boys, young men, and they can come here. They can, they, they still, much of the future available. They can go to school here. They are strong, they can work. They, this, they, are, they are dependable. I mean, uh, it, it sort of which means they are independent. They can do things. I guess that met that appealing, uh, appeal to the Congress uh, members here during, during that time. So we were accepted to come to America. America. None of us could not believe that at that time. We, we never, thought, it never crossed our mind that we were gonna go to other places, you know, uh, like America. So what happened is that file were not really kept well. So there are those with only one name, there are those with missing name, there are those with the name but no birth date. So all of this, so these, these guys from America went there, what is called joint voluntary agents, uh, JBA went there and then look at the file and then they sort it out. And then they start those with clear names like us. Uh, and then we start, you know, then they start process. And then they were, I guess they were going to bring all of us to America, but they were putting it in, they organize it. Uh, somehow, and then some of the lost boys and then some girl too, like my wife, we happened to be given a chance to come to America. Those came to America one by one. And, uh, and then, then from there, September 11, America was attacked. And that actually stopped America from bringing the rest of the lost boys there. Because America then went back and changed uh, migration policies and things like that. And so unfortunately, some of us didn't make it to America because of September 11. At what point do you remember the point, or was it a time period where you went, all right, I feel like I'm an American now. And when was that? And at how long had you been in America? And what do you think made you feel, I'm adjusted to life in America? <laughs> well, I don't know if, um, when you talk about adjustment, I don't think I am fully adjusted to the American life, even today. Uh, there are things that are still, uh, you know, surprising to me. American life, American culture, way things are done, how do you address people? It's, I gotta tell you, I guess I'm gonna learn until I'm no longer here. Uh, you know, it's take time. Remember learning a culture, you will never learn a culture, but you live the culture. So, you, Kevin, you were born in this country, and these students that are going to be watching this were born in this country. So they are emerged into the culture. As they were born into it, they're going to grow into it. These are the people, the best people learn their culture. With us, we have this feeling of where if you go to a new place, you must fit, you know? <laughs> you must find a way to fit, although, you still rare inside, you must fit into this culture so you can survive. So literally for me, and maybe for other lost boys and girls, it, it, it the, the idea that find a way to fit. One of the, what was my way of trying to fit here in America? For example, I know right away for me to survive here, America is not gonna be waiting for me and say, hey, you know what, this guy just came yesterday and let him give him a chance, okay? There will be more, more Americans who would give me a chance to, give me time to learn, give me time to, but there will be those who, you know, they will not be waiting for me for a long time, really. I mean, even though they are what? They, they give me whatever they can give me to learn, but if I can, well, they have life to live. So they keep going. So what I did was I said, okay, 
for me here, I, I, I wouldn't be a motivational speaker or I want to do something. I want to build this, I want to do that, I want to make my life better. The only way that I can make my life better is to be able to communicate. I want your student to understand this. Commun ability to communicate, it's so important. I don't care whether you are a mathematician or you are an um, engineer or whatever it is, those don't count unless you can communicate what you know. That is when people will take you seriously. And this is when you can become better successful. Communication. What did I do? I, for example, when I was in my uh, apartment, I turned on CNN or Fox News or something like that. And then, and then I closed the door. And then when the presenter say a word, I say loud. The reason I close the door is so I cannot be embarrassed by saying things, keep saying it loud, right? So it's self-taught here. So I have to pronounce like the way they do, like the way they pronounce certain word. Uh, so for me to fit into the American culture, I want to know what, what kind of books they read when they were in their middle school, when they were in high school. You know, so I would, I would talk to my coworker and say, so when you were young, what kind of book did you read? Because the reason why is because these books this literature is what makes America, America. You talk about Mark Twain, you know, the Mark Twain, he wrote so many books and so on. So somebody gave me the How to Kill the Mockingbird. Uh, so that's, it's a, it's a book known in America. Uh, the Animal Farm, the, 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 the Mike, Mike and Men, Mike and Men, something like that, Mikey and Men, something like that. So then they will give me these book titles and then I go to the library. These literatures are what make America, America. This is the, the foundation of culture in America. Because what is said in those books is what people are talking about. I can tell you on and on the way I want to fit into the American culture. That was an outstanding answer. I really like, I'd never thought of that, um, John, the idea of reading the books of the culture to fit into the culture, I think, that's amazing. And I think kids might appreciate the literature they're reading a little more if they realize it's part of a, a larger culture picture. Okay, so are you ready, my friend? The zinger question is upon us. Your wife, Martha, asked this question. What was the reason for getting two gallons of milk on your first trip to the grocery <laughs> store? <laughs> uh, you know, okay, so back home. Remember, I was talking to you about growing around cows and goats and animals, things like that. Remember, I told you that. Uh, we used to drink a lot of milk. It's what you had to drink because my children asked me, Baba, Dad, why are you tall? And I told, and I've been telling them, you know, it's because I drink a lot of milk. <laughs> so, so, so milk is so important in our life, way, way important. So, get this. From 19, from 1987 to 2001, that time I have never drank milk at all because there was no milk. You cannot afford buying milk. In the refugee camp, no milk. If there was some milk there were given to very small children, little, little kids, you, you can't, we adult, we can't. And we had no money to buy milk. When we came to the United States, the first day we were taken to the, 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 the first day we, we, you know, we arrived in America, we arrived in America at night, uh, the morning, following morning, volunteers came and take, uh, they, 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 they um, you know, took us to a, a grocery store. Fortunately, we found something looked like milk and they were completely milk, you know? So you go, we went to these islands and say, what is that milk? And then the volunteer, uh, Susan Myers and Penny Allen say, yeah, this is milk, cow milk? Yes. Wow, okay. So now they ask us to select what we want to, to cook, you know? Well, we didn't really, we keep moving around, keep moving, we, we want milk. We didn't tell them we want milk, but we keep, so, so three of us. So we went there and we were about to say, okay, you guys pick what you want. So what we went there, I took two gallons of milk Jacob took gallon two, uh, two, two gallons of milk. Andrew took two gallons of milk, six of them. 
and we put them in the 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 you know in the in the cart, and then so the volunteer said, "Don't you want you know buy more?" And they said, "No." And they said, "Do you want this milk?" Yeah, we say yes, and they look at at each other <laughs> because American people are very very polite. They didn't want to say anything, or they I guess maybe giggle a little bit, but um, so. We said, that's what we want. Okay, they said, okay, all right. We took them to our apartment. We could not wait for these volunteers to go home. You know, you know so as the moment they got out, went into their car, drove away, we went back and started drinking our milk. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, we, we were drinking milk for the next three days like that. There was no food, milk is the food, you know? So that's it. So it was that because we went there for that long with no milk. I've got to know now, just a quick follow-up to that. What did you think of the taste of the milk? You, I mean, it must have been different than what you expected. Very different, very different. And so what we did, we put some sugar in it so that it, we were able to drink it. Uh, so, uh, so it was not like our delicious milk from our cows that we we drink right from there. Our, our, our milk don't go through something called processing, no. There's something else you want them to think about. And I also really want you to talk about um, the, the great things you're doing for the people in South Sudan still. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I would really like to invite those who will be watching this video. Uh, what, what is so important in my life is to save life. Save life of the people in South Sudan. This is what I have done since I came to United States. That is why I formed the John Dow Foundation uh, that has created multiple uh, facilities in South Sudan as we speak. The time I met Kevin, there was only one clinic. Now we have 19 facilities, 19 clinics right now. And it is so important to actually tell you that I could not do this without the support from the great Americans. The great Americans mean those who are watching, including kids, those who are watching, will be watching this, uh, you know, uh, video here. These are, uh, you, you, you guys made it so uh, important for my people to survive. So the John Dow Foundation have these facilities. If there's a way you can support John Dow, it, this way you support the people of South Sudan through the John Dow Foundation. If you want to do it through a website, you can go to www.johndow.com foundation, Dao mean D-A-U, foundation.org, and you can go to the donate button, you can do that, or you can send it to our, um, you know, mail uh, information is there where you can mail your check there, or another better yet is that you get, uh, you know, support, uh, you know, support us by spreading the word. If you go to the John Duff Foundation Facebook account, I am raising money for COVID-19 response in South Sudan. Janda Foundation, the only organization that is working hard right now. As you have seen what the COVID-19 have done to America, great country, big country, wealthy country, strong uh, country with a very strong uh, health system that was built 200 years ago. What about a country like South Sudan just gain independence uh, just a few years ago, uh, just get out of civil war? Uh, what, what, we have no health system. Completely, there's nothing there. Only, we have only four, four ventilators right now as we speak, you know, only four. So, and we don't even know whether these four ventilators are working. So South Sudan is completely in a very terrible shape. But if you can help John Duff Foundation so that we can help people there, I think that's important. People say, well, I have only $10, I have $5, what can, I gotta tell you, that $5 is so important. It's going to be, uh, you put together with another $5 there, with something there, it's going to save life. So there is way you can support the John Duff Foundation, uh, you know, please do so. It's the right time now to support the John Duff Foundation. We have, John Duff Foundation have infrastructure. That means we have employees. We have 450 employees. These people are ready. They are, in the, you know, nurses, midwife, and all of those clinical officers, doctors, and all kind of uh, uh, people. They are committed. So it's right time now for you to support us, support, John, pe support people of South Sudan through the John Duff Foundation. I would really, really appreciate it. And I want to also appreciate your student for wanting to support us. This is, this is a great thing.
Thank you so much. Thank you, John.